So Galatians 5 verses 22 and 23, they speak of three words which I, have a, I tend to battle with a bit. Maybe you battle with them as well and that is the meaning and what they mean just at face value and what, is, what do they mean from God's point of view? What is God wanting? Those words are peace, kindness and gentleness. Now, our contemporary world that we live in has certain connotations and they define them in a certain way and to a large degree they do get them right for example peaceable if you went and looked up the definition for that that means inclined to avoid argument or violent conflict if you look up gentle that is defined as not harsh or severe having or showing a mild kind or tender temperament and kind that would be defined as having or showing a friendly, generous, and considerate nature. Now, I think even when you're a kid, when you're a small little child, you can understand the concept, but sometimes these things kind of cross over a bit. And I just want to, before I get into this, to kind of help distinguish between these things. And one of the best ways is to kind of look at the opposite. What is the opposite? of this fruit of the spirit that's been spoken of. Peaceable is not difficult to figure out. That's usually violent. If you're not gentle, what are you? Generally, you're harsh, not necessarily violent. If you are not kind, what would you normally be called? And that might not be too clear, but uh, one thing that a search on this brought up is that the word cruel is maybe the best opposite there and that's willfully causing pain or suffering so how do we see these things in our world and how can we recognize these things how are they epitomized in people and for peaceable that's usually a person who resolves arguments they resolve debates when there's two uh, parties that want to go to court that would be the kind of person who would resolve the differences and the word we normally use today is mediator so that kind of captures that idea of peaceable the word gentle um, I had to think about this a bit but it's best seen in how we deal with demanding situations and I think one of the maybe the best example maybe you agree with me is when you're trying to dis discipline a wayward child and that's not your own child how do you deal with that you've got to be you've got to be gentle about it and uh, another way of looking at this is also directing others if you're a person that's in charge of others if you're a manager in a company you can't be harsh you can't be a brute all the time you're not going to get anywhere with the people so the, the two words to me that kind of home in on what gentleness means is discipline, disciplining of other people and also directing of others uh, and that is what's going to come into focus very quickly you know are, are you gentle or are you harsh and when it comes to kindness again it's not that straightforward the best thing I could think of was uh, how to deal wisely with limited resources when you've got all the money in the world it's very easy to be generous but when you don't have a lot of stuff how do you go about that and again if you're a leader or you're an administrator or something of that nature that attributes gonna show itself because if you know how to deal with limited resources you must be pretty good and maybe you are a kind person as well and sometimes kindness involves tact and wisdom and especially when you're in pressing circumstances and as much as we like to bang in our leaders and our politicians sometimes, sometimes you've also got to recognize they got limited resources and maybe they're doing a very good job and maybe they are being kind. Um, so unless you deal with gentle and harsh people side by side frequently, it's not always going to be easy to understand. And when you're a child, even though you can sense these things in a person's demeanor, um, it's not easy to define it very clearly so I'm going to spend a little bit of time on that even from a scriptural point of view it's not straightforward to grasp how this works 
you take some insight. So I've got some, some quotes from uh, people that are in the world. They're actually, a number of them are religious people. One of them is, in our rough and rugged individualism, we think of gentleness as weakness, being soft and virtually spineless. Not so. Gentleness includes such enviable qualities as having strength under control, being calm and peaceful when surrounded by a heated atmosphere, emitting a soothing effect on those who may be angry or otherwise beside themselves, and possessing tact and gracious courtesy that causes others to retain their self-esteem and dignity. Instead of losing the gentle gain, instead of being ripped off and taken advantage of, I come out ahead. And I know in today's society there can be a lot of question about that. By the way, this was Charles Swindle who said this. He's an evangelical preacher. Um, but if you look at the case of Jesus, he was not a rough person. He ended up coming out ahead. And I don't think any of us can argue about that, even though um, he was a gentle person. Another definition is gentleness corrects whatever is offensive in our manner. And that's by Hugh Blair. That's a Scottish theologian. Another thing, I learned that it is the weak who are cruel and that gentleness is to be expected only from the strong. That's someone named Leah Rostin. He's an American novelist. And then he has another quote you might recognize. What would you have? Your gentleness shall force more than your force move us to gentleness. That was William Shakespeare. Um, in the Bible, there's clearly this word is used many times. And there's a few verses I just want to go over that help us to understand just how serious God is about this. In Colossians chapter 3, verse 12, it says, Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. In Titus chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, it says, Remind the people to be subject to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready to do whatever is good, to slander no one, to be peaceable and considerate, and always to be gentle toward everyone. In Proverbs 15 verse 4, it says, A gentle tongue is a tree of life, but perverseness in it breaks the spirit. In 2 Timothy 2, verse 24 to 26, there's more information. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Opponents must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth, and that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil, who has taken them captive to do his will. So it's very clear that this is something God wants in us. He wants us to probably be trained in it. And even though as children, we prob our parents probably do their best to train us in being gentle, we pretty much know that the world kind of brings out the worst in us sometimes. And sometimes that nice fine edge gets rubbed away and you can't find it anymore. So when you grow up and you realize what God wants for you, you've got to work at that that attribute again, that fruit of the Spirit that He wants us to have. And as easy as it may be to say these things, I think we all recognize, if you try and look at this pragmatically, that it's not an easy thing to get right. There's a balance. <clears throat> and I think we, we can all recognize that when you're a parent and you have to train a, a two to a five-year-old, you've got to train them to stay within these two bounds. And the one is being overly agreeable and being the nice guy all the time. And nice guys seem to have a stigma. In some people's eyes, it's a good thing. In other people's eyes, being a nice guy is the wrong thing. But there is a balance again. And the bad, the bad side of that is you can end up being used in other people's schemes. You can cater to people's whims and desires. And we know that is not always a good thing. The good thing about the agreeable side to us is that we can end up living for other people the way Jesus did. 
And we all know that in the right situation, the right circumstances, that is a good thing. There's the other extreme when it comes to this, and that is uh, being disagreeable and being aggressive. The, the good thing about that is people know what's on your mind. You're not scared to say how, what you feel. But the bad thing is, if you say too much, it's not always a wise thing. You can come off as callous and you get into trouble very easily. And it's not just trouble with people, you can get into trouble with the authorities. Um, so there's, and just to kind of like broaden the scope, when you read in the Bible on the subject, they use different words for th things that I'm gonna talk about. For gentleness, the, the words that are equivalent are meekness and humility. Um, now, one of, the act, one of the things that we find in the Bible as well is rebuking. And that's one thing I want to just take a look at as well. The word rebuking, that can be used in place of reprimand or reprehend, or even in some versions of the scriptures, the word judge. And we all think judging is bad. But uh, in a sense, if you think about it, when you're reprimanding someone, you are judging them. You essentially realize they need to change or they need to do something different. In Jude 1 verse 9, I think the, the idea of how we need to go about rebuking is captured very well. Jude 1 9 says, But even the archangel Michael, when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, did not himself dare to condemn him for slander, but said, The Lord rebuke you. And you can find other uh, instruction in verses like Galatians 6 verse 1, Proverbs 9, 8 verse, verses 8 and 9, Proverbs 27 verse 5, 1 Timothy 5 verse 20. And there's a host of scriptures that speak about rebuking. Uh, another one that I think we might, may be familiar with, which is really applicable here, is 2 Timothy 4 verse 2, it says, Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. And I think there's a great key word in that verse, and that is patience. Um, if you're going to rebuke people correctly, you've got to have patience. Otherwise, it goes to that extreme that you don't want to be in. <clears throat> and we need to understand also the authority and the conditions under which scripture gives us permission for for doing these things um, when you look at the subject you might if you're a critic of christianity and of of scripture in general you may be thinking of something hang on hang on hang on what about jesus there were things jesus did in his life that you might want to say hang on was he gentle here was he doing the right thing now, as Christians, we know Jesus walked the perfect walk. So I want to look at three things that Jesus did that our adversaries may say, hang on, Jesus wasn't all he was cut out to be. And that's where I want you to go to Matthew 21, if you're there. And I want to read the verses from verse 12 to verse 17. Uh, and if you're so inclined... Uh, as extra work afterwards you can go and look at John 2 it gives some more detail on this matter and this is Jesus and the money changes in the temple and Jesus entered the temple and drove out all those who were buying and selling in the temple and overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who were selling doves and he said to them it is written my house shall be called a house of prayer but you are making it a robber's den. And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things he had done, and the children who were shouting in the temple, Hosanna to son of David, they became indignant and said to him, Do you hear what these children are saying? And Jesus said to them, Yes, have you never read out of the mouth of infants and nursing babies, you have prepared praise for yourself. And he left them and went out of the city to Bethany 
and spent the night there. So if you look at this off the cuff, you're wondering, is Jesus being aggressive here? And we've got to look at what's happening here and look at it in its context as to what's going on. <clears throat> Jesus did not punish or discipline these money changers, but he did express God's feeling on the matter. If he did discipline them, like he did with demons when he was casting out demons, they may have become broken, spirited people. And that's, we know that's not what God wants in people. So Jesus did not go to that extreme where he would have caused too much anguish in these people's lives so that they turn away. On the night of Jesus' betrayal, a greater offense was committed when Peter denied knowing him three times, but Jesus forgave him. And if you consider the the wrongness in those two situations, I'm thinking Peter denying him was probably a greater offense and Jesus managed to forgive him. That kind of brings a little bit of perspective onto what was happening in the temple area. The important thing in this passage is we need to look at what happened straight after that rebuking that Jesus did. If Jesus had been overly harsh with the money changers, this likely would not have happened. It would have been an atmosphere in which probably no one would have wanted to be seeking out God if he had been too hard on those people. And if you look at John 2 verse 15, there's mention of a whip. Now that's pretty severe. Would you think that's severe? I think that's severe. But if he did not use a whip, these specific people would likely not have responded to his words at all. You need to keep in mind who he was dealing with at this point. If you've ever been dealing with people on the street, if you've been dealing with money dealers, and you would realize they would probably not respond to uh, meek or calm words at all. And I just think of in our society, there is an equivalent that we can relate to pretty easily. If you've ever gone car buying, and you've dealt with the dealers that deal with trying to sell at a certain price, how does that go? Are you meek? Are you gentle? How does that work? It's never going to happen. Nothing's ever going to be in your advantage if, you, if you're dealing at that level. <clears throat> Being the nice guy in a situation like that will get you nowhere. But these people would likely have ignored Jesus had he been meek and gentle in the, the, the typical sense we think of it, he had to probably raise his voice a bit there so that they paid attention. And the fact that he used the whip made sure that he had, they had his attention. Um, chances are these money changers were discouraging the children and those in physical need from being in the temple courts. We need to understand in the environment that he was working in then, there was limited space. And when I dug a little into this, there's some students and writers today that think there may have been no room for the foreigners to be worshipping God in the courts due to all the space being taken up by these dealers. We need to understand that when it comes to these ceremonies, people come from far away. Um, so if you had to now go and offer your best sheep, this could be quite a thing to accomplish because now you've got to travel possibly hundreds of miles with your best sheep. When you get to where, get to the temple where you want to offer this, I'm not too sure that sheep's going to be your best sheep at that point. What do you do? This is one of the reasons why you seeing what was happening there. There was actually trading for animals going on. Jesus was not necessarily trying to shut down that business so to speak. If you look at what happened afterwards, there was room for the children to come, there was room for those in need uh, to come and worship God the way they should and maybe get things they needed to get there at the temple. And in that respect, um, Jesus was doing God's will. He was making sure the people that needed attention, the people that get marginalized, as we say, they had space to come and to worship God the way God intended. And if you're still a bit skeptical on this, just think of it this way. 
If you're a manager, do you not have the right to rebuke your workers that you pay? If you're an elder, you've got a bigger charge than just being a manager. If you're an elder, do you not have the right to rebuke a church member if they're doing something wrong? And does not the creator of all men not have the right to rebuke his dearly beloved creatures? So there's another instance as well where we might want to pick on Jesus and, and think he was not being gentle. If you turn a few pages over from where you are in Matthew 21 to Matthew 23, there's a passage you should be familiar with, and that is the woes that Jesus spoke against the Pharisees and the teachers. But woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you shut off the kingdom of heaven from people, for you do not enter in yourselves, nor do you allow those who are enter, entering to go in. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you devour wood, widows' houses, and for a pretense you make long prayers. Therefore you will receive greater condemnation. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you travel around on sea and land and make one proselyte and when he becomes one, you make him twice as much a son of hell as yourselves. So Jesus has several things like this to say in this passage. But the interesting thing is, even though this sounds harsh, when we get to the end of this passage in verse 37, we get a different picture here. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together, the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were unwilling. Behold, your house is being left to you desolate. For I say to you, from now on, you will not see me until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So at the very end of this passage, we're getting Jesus' true feelings, which kind of gives a whole perspective to what's going on here. Even though these, these are probably words that the scribes and the Pharisees didn't want to hear, he expressed that he really does love them and he really does want them to be part of his kingdom. And I just want to add a note concerning this passage. <clears throat> when we use the word rebuke, it's usually a, a meaning of expression of sharp disapproval or criticism. But the word that Jesus is using here is woe. And if you look at the definition of that, it basically means sorrow and distress. So he was saying sorrow and distress to you, scribes and Pharisees, throughout that passage. He was not actually banging them on the head, so to speak, but this was a warning that he was giving to these guys to give them a chance to correct and repent and do the right thing. Okay, there's one final thing I want to look at that Jesus did, <clears throat> which also seems a little out of character. But when Jesus rebukes Peter, this is in Matthew 16, verse 23, we tend to think this is another side of Jesus that doesn't seem to line up with a lot of other things in, path, in Scripture. He turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You're a hindrance to me. For you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. The point here is that Peter stumbles, and there's a flashback moment here, in case you haven't realized it. Satan in the wilderness presented the same temptation to Jesus as well. You don't have to go through the suffering, just bow down to me and it's all going to go easy. It was the same sort of thing Jesus realized, who is this really coming from? It's not really Peter who's come, this is coming from. This is Satan that's planted an idea in his head. And of course, Peter, as we were discussing in Bible study this morning, the disciples had a hard time being on the same wavelength that Jesus was on, even though he was training them and teaching them an awful lot. Three years of training, you think you'd know something, but they were still battling with the concept. And the same was happening with Peter here. He didn't realize that he wasn't being for Jesus' mission when he said this, but he was being against Jesus' mission. And that Jesus was being committed to his Father 
and the covenant that was in place at that time demanded that sin had to be repaid in full with blood and I think maybe for a moment you know Peter didn't realize this maybe this wasn't a thought in his head and he, he was just thinking how any one of us would think when there's someone in danger you immediately want to protect them if someone says they're going to go to their death how would you react you normally want to do everything to prevent that and the thing is Peter was missing a major point of the training he'd been going through and if he did not back down I think he would have had a very serious problem that day <clears throat> so the conclusion of this is we can be tempted to look at a lot of these passages and a lot of the material in the Bible as we do with multimedia today and the, what is that problem we, we lack some context we lack tone in which words are being said we lack um, possibly body language that may give something away and we all know if you send if you don't word things right in an email you can end up getting into trouble and, and in my workplace there was a lot of training in that at one time like you need to be very careful how you word things because people can take it in the wrong way and you you know either your reputation is going to be tarnished or if it's someone in authority you're going to be in serious trouble and there is a little bit of this going on in scripture as well so we've got to be careful about reading into some of these passages what we think is anger what we think is harshness um, even though the incident with Peter the tendency is to think this is harsh we weren't there we don't know the, the tone that Jesus used we don't know the uh, body language he used um, there's a number of indicators we all know when you have face-to-face -face communication that you just cannot convey in writing so the bottom line is these words could easily have been taken in the wrong way um, if there was anger all other material about Jesus indicates they, he would not have lingered in this emotion we know that from all other passages there were about Jesus he was a gentle person even with the demons he was dealing with he had a way of going about that where the demons actually even had options if you think about it he gave them a choice on how to be dealt with in, in certain cases yes he was very authoritative and he said be quiet or be still and that did happen <clears throat> the, the important thing to realize behind all of this when we consider Jesus is that when Jesus walked the earth he stated he did not come to judge the world and that that is true from the beginning of the Gospels to the end of the Gospels and even now he does not want to judge the world at this point so if that is something we believe we're, we're going to realize a lot of these things where Jesus is speaking the intention certainly wasn't to come off as judging and a condemnation nature when the time comes for judgment as we should all know he will not have to be angry he will have all the authority at that point to tell us where we belong and I seriously doubt any of us will be able to refuse that whether you were for Jesus or against him so that's it in summary so if you want to make sure that you're on the right side of Jesus and you haven't been baptized and maybe you want to study more about him now is an opportunity to come up here and if there's any other prayer request as well you can come up and share that with us now as together we stand and sing